Hey, everybody, this is Chris and Kathy from Petability Podcast. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to Petability Podcast through your favorite streaming app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Petability Podcast and share our content on social media. You can also support the show by making a donation. Simply go to our website at petabilitypodcast.buzzsprout.com and click on the heart symbol at the top of the page. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good morning, Kathy. How are you this fine, snowy day? Good morning, Chris. It's a wonderful, crisp New England snowy day. (laughs) Again. (laughs) I'm inside. (laughs) Yep. But you know what's going to make this day even better? Oh, I do know what's going to make this day better because this is going to be, this is, I mean, the only thing I like talking more about what we're going to talk about today is dog feet, as you know, because I like to talk about dogs. We're a little obsessed with feet. Yes, we are. We are. But um, do tell Chris, what are we going to talk about today? Today, today we are diverging into an equally exciting topic of the world of puppies. Yay. Yay. Nothing is better than puppies. (laughs) Nothing is better than puppies. Maybe kittens. They're great too. (laughs) So yeah, we're going to be learning everything there is to know about uh, puppies physically, emotionally. And I think this is going to be a really, really great show, especially given the fact that the, the backdrop is we are in the middle of our coronavirus pandemic. And uh, for those of you who don't know, there is a uh, shortage of puppies out there because everybody during the pandemic has wanted to get uh, a puppy, whether it's adopted or from a breeder. So this is a very timely topic. And to that end, I have my dear friend and colleague with us, Christy Williams. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Christy. She is a certified veterinary technician and has been working in the field of veterinary medicine for over 20 years. And indeed, we met each other uh, first at a place of employment that we shared, and that was somewhere maybe around 2007. So we've known each other for a long time. And she has been helping dogs and puppies and their owners with basic pet training and manners for over 25 years but her passion is puppies, so we picked the right person. Christy began teaching puppy obedience classes while living in England. This is something I just learned uh, about her. So when she was living in England, she was contracted by the Army to help military families with their pets. Since then, she has worked with families and puppies to overcome many behavior problems using only positive motivational methods. And in 2019, she earned her certification in canine fitness training and has been working to keep both pet and working sporting dogs fit. When Christy is not working, which I'm not sure when that is, uh, Christy enjoys spending time training her own dogs, who I've had the pleasure to meet and know over the years. So Gronk is a seven-year-old Cavalier Bichon mix. And she recently got Kayak, who is now a one-year-old Border Collie. Christy has competed with Gronk to earn him a title in USDAA and looks forward to competing with Kayak when he is mature enough. So these are agility competitions. And she also enjoys hiking with her dogs and spending time with her family. So welcome, Christy Williams. Welcome, Christy. Thank you very much for having me. So, Kathy, what, what's the first thing you want to ask Christy? Oh, uh, Christy, first of all, I can't tell you how excited I am to, to, to talk with you because, again, this is just one of my favorite uh, topics to talk about is puppies. And so I wanted to start the conversation a little bit with talking to, talking to you about the stages of puppy development. So, you know, what, what owners, you know, may think of, too, when they think of puppy development is, is physically, you know, they're puppies, then they're going to be adolescents, and then they're going to be adults, but they're but on, but they're experiencing a, a mental growth as well. They're experiencing an emotional growth as well. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the stages of puppy development, mentally and physically. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and going along with what you're saying, I'm very passionate about puppies. I think that, you know, they're little sponges and they're so much fun. And, and when people bring a puppy into their home, that's how they should approach it. It should be fun. But there is a lot of things that people don't always take into account. And, and certainly the the development of a puppy mentally is something that a lot of people don't think about. Um, so there are there are four stages. Um, the first, actually, yeah, there are five, actually. The first stage is a neonate stage. So that is from birth to two weeks. At that stage, they are 100% reliant on their mom. The, the bitch takes care of them. She feeds them. She cleans them. They can't do anything. They can't hear. They can't see. They're reliant on their mom. Um, but what we're finding is that in that neonatal stage, that a very small amount of stress will have a huge impact on their life later on. So what a lot of breeders are starting are doing, um, I'm not sure if it's just starting, but what a lot of breeders are doing is taking them away from the mom just for seconds. And you don't want a lot of stress, but maybe tickling their toe with a cotton ball, putting them back, taking them away from their mom so their temperature drops a tiny little bit, putting them back with their mom. And that stress that they're putting on that puppy, as little as it is, it definitely has an impact on their adult temperament and ability to handle stress. I know it seems really tiny, but it does make a difference. So they say that, you know, in those first two weeks, those puppies should be handled. I think back in the day, a lot of breeders would just leave them alone. Don't touch the puppies, don't touch the puppies. Um, but they are finding that having handling in that neonatal stage is really important. And to your point, like you were saying that, um, you know, it may not seem like much, right? Like you take them away for a few seconds and put them back. Well, you certainly don't want to overwhelm. So this is one of the, those cases where less is more, but that less is so vital, right, to their, to their overall development and in going into adulthood, it sounds like. So it, yeah, it absolutely is. And it, you know, again, it seems like such a small thing, but they're, they're developing, their whole nervous system is developing. So to have that tiny little bit of stress to us probably wouldn't even notice it. Right it does make a difference with their adults, the way they're, they're going to handle things later on in life. Okay. So then the next stage is transition. So this period is, starts at about three weeks of life. And this is when the puppy starts to do a little bit more. So they start to walk a little bit and they start to hear and their eyes start to open. So this is a, it's an important part of a puppy's life um, just because they're, they're learning so many different things. Um, then the stage after that is the most important stage. So the next stage is socialization. And the socialization period starts at around four weeks and it actually starts to close between 12 and 14 weeks. Um, so I think when people think of socializing their puppy, you know, they bring a puppy home at eight weeks and then they think, oh, I'm gonna wait a couple weeks. I'm gonna let the puppy get acclimated to the house. I'm not gonna do anything. And then at 16 weeks, all right, now we're gonna go to a puppy class. And when you think about that, they've already lost so much time. Right. So that's so I have sorry. a question. That I know sometimes people are fearful to to bring their puppy out because of vaccines or lack thereof. Yeah. And, and I'm not actually sure of the timing uh, on that. So, um, you know, would people be able to bring their their puppies to a class during that period? Are they adequately immunized? So. I always tell people to yield to their vet. I'm not going to um, question what a vet's going to tell them. But what I will say is that um, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behaviors, they believe that puppies can start puppy classes as early as seven to eight weeks. Wow. They should have had their first vaccine at least seven days prior. But they feel that we lose a lot more animals to behavior issues for under socializing than we do to mm -hmm. disease. Yeah. Um, so, but my caveat is always make sure you're taking your puppy someplace safe. So where there are other similar age puppies, make sure that it's clean. You're not walking in and smelling poop or, you know, it's clean. You don't want your puppy going someplace dirty. Um, and make sure that they're checking those vaccines to make sure that everyone's starting. Cause throughout that class, you're going to be finishing your puppy series but you want to make sure that they're checking because some people will, some, some trainers will have you tell you you need to have it, but they don't check. 
So mm. you want to make sure everyone's in the same boat. And you don't, yes, puppy classes, I think, are very important, but you, there's so many other places you can take them. I take my own dogs. Yeah, I take my own dogs to Lowe's all the time. The people at Lowe's are fabulous. Uh, they love to see a puppy. Who doesn't love to see a puppy? Right. Um, so, you know, I'll take my dog to, I don't have children, but I might take them to a ballpark and from a distance, even if I'm still holding the puppy, they're seeing things going on. You know, the most important thing that we can do is keep these puppies safe, both physically and mentally. So if you take your puppy to any of these places and, and they're overwhelmed, they look, they seem a little bit like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? You know, you back away, you help them out, you use treats, you use rewards, but they need to be exposed to all of these things early. Like I said, between four and 12 weeks old and, and you know, at least four of those weeks we lost to the breeder. So we need to make sure that breeder is doing a lot as far as having a stimulating environment and, and teaching these puppies to, to walk on different surfaces, to have maybe one new toy put in their pen every day. Um, so they need to have a little bit of change and stimulation in that pen because that's a big part of their socializing time. So is there more, can you, can you expound a little bit more in terms of this uh, socialization period? Because I know they're still, you know, kind of developing physically, you know, they're still awkward and clumsy and, and so forth. But uh, Christy, I cheated a little bit just because I, I didn't know much about puppies and um, I was reading, you know, some of the subsets in this socialization period. And uh, one of the first ones that I came across was this awareness um, that that these different things, like you mentioned, different textures, surfaces, um, sights, sounds, they're, they just have an awareness that they exist, but it's all normal at that point. So if I understand the question, it's, it's just being around those things, just understanding that they're there. So you don't, I don't necessarily need to, I don't know, walk my dog up to every single bicycle that I see, but if I'm on a trail and there's a bicycle, they see it. It just mm -hmm. happens. It shouldn't, it's not a big deal. It's just, it just is. Is that, is that what you mean? Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Just awareness of their environment and, and yeah. yep, it just is. Um, can you expound a little bit about um, like, where do they learn uh, impulse control and things like that? And so, I mean, impulse control is, is, is taught a lot from the mom. So, mm. um, you know, they learn a lot from being with their mother. Um, it's one of the reasons why taking a puppy away from their mom too early is the problem. They learn how to play and, and how to bite gently when they're playing with their litter mates you know, and then a lot of things, you know, we teach them as they, you know, they come into our house and we teach them, well, no, you can't grab everything off the counter. No, you can't. You teach them those sorts of impulses. Yep. Yeah. I think too, like, you know, those razor sharp uh, <laughs> teeth. Yeah. Um, I think mom gets a little annoyed, right? When, when the puppies are too aggressive, like when they start to have Absolutely. their teeth come in and then they, you know, and they're, they're uh, biting mom, you know, when they're trying to suckle and, um, you know, that sort of thing. So she'll, she'll reprimand and give them those, those boundaries and, and learning that, that bite inhibition. Um, I think absolutely. As well. And they learn that from their litter mates as well. If they are, you know, they're playing with their litter mate and they go a little bit too far, the litter mate, if you watch a litter of puppies, which is a terrible time waster, I could do it for the day, just sit and watch. <laughs> um, but you just, you watch them and if one bites too hard, the other one's going to correct them. Uh -huh. And if they learn that from a young age, you know, you end up with a, a, an older dog, an adult dog who understands that you can't go running up to strange dogs and, you know, bite them hard. You have to have that bite inhibition. And that's where they learn it is from, from the litter. They learn it from their litter mates and from their mom. Um, so what's, what's the emotional impact then of a, of a singleton? What's, what, what happens there? I mean, I guess they would learn from their mom, but will there be any, emotional fallout from that later on in life that they didn't have siblings to wrestle with or play or yeah there I mean there is there they're definitely um most reputable breeders good breeders will figure out a way to have them around other puppies because they know these puppies are going to be very attached to humans 
They're mm. not going to necessarily know how to play with other dogs, other puppies. Um, and they can be a little bit more stressed because they don't have that interaction with other dogs. So you can end up with, you know, aggression and fear towards other dogs mm. because they just don't know how to interact with them. Interesting. So let me ask you this. If, if they uh, had litter mates, mm -hmm. but were removed from, you know, their, their mom or their siblings too early, is that like, let's say at six weeks or seven weeks or something like that, is that enough time for them to, to learn some of these skills or is there an ideal time to actually take a puppy away from, from its mom and, and siblings? Yeah. That's, so that's interesting as well. I, my very first dog, I took away from the litter because I had no idea. They, they took, sent him home with me at six weeks old and he was incredibly aggressive towards other dogs. He also had a handler who didn't know what he was doing. She was doing, sorry, me. Um, <laughs> so he did, he did. Um, we all he, learned. We, we, learned. Did, we did learn. And he said, this is why I do what I do is because of him. Um, but he, they're taken at six weeks old. And when you think that their socializing period only really starts at four weeks, they've only got a couple weeks under their belt. And they're not playing as much as they would in that for the, you know, week mm. four to six as they would six to eight. So mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of studies out there that show when you take a puppy away from their mom too early, a, they, they've lost a lot of that playtime with, with their litter mates. They don't learn that bite inhibition and they are a lot more stressed. It doesn't mean that they're going to bond with a human better. Mm. There's no evidence to prove that if you take a puppy younger, they bond with their human better. It means that they, they, they don't handle stress as well. They may not handle stress as well. And they may also end up with a fear or an aggression towards other dogs. So, so there, there's a, actually a lot of behaviorists now who recommend leaving them until 10 weeks, which I don't huh. know many breeders that would be on board for that, but, um, but they, they think even just a couple weeks longer helps them develop. That was going to be my question is, is, is there conversely, I guess, can you leave a puppy with their siblings and mom too long in that, then they won't, you know, bond with their, their person that's, that's taking them in. Is there a, a too long time period? Yeah. And I think that there is, um, I don't know the exact number. I think that, so sort of depending on the state that you're in, most states won't allow a puppy to go home before eight weeks old. That's, that's a law. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably a pretty good age. Um, I don't think it would hurt for another week or two. Um, but I think if you leave them too long, A, they really start to beat each other up. They ah. start to play really rough. Um, and most breeders are, they won't even let them stay together. So if there's an exception, so, you know, someone can't take their puppy until 10 or 11 weeks and maybe they're keeping a puppy, they don't even let them play that much at that point because they're just beating the crap out of each other. Um, and they're going to bond with each other. So and then you're going to separate them. And then right, you're going to separate you know, them, right? <laughs> I think if you're doing it at 10 weeks, 10, 12 weeks, you're still going to be absolutely fine. But if you wait till four or five months, there is a bond there that may be difficult to have the, the new human in their life replaced. It's, uh, it's so fascinating to me that they have this... I mean, you and I, I mean, well, I'm, I'm still probably developing emotionally, but, um, right. I mean, from a human perspective, we're developing emotionally from the time we're born until, you know, probably into our twenties and thirties. And there's just this small window, right. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, it's just fascinating to me that they learn all of this, all of this, or have these stages that they learn in such a quick time frame, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then what we've done is now we've asked them, okay, now we've asked you to live in the human world. So now we're taking you and you're, you're 12 or 13 weeks old and um, we're saying, okay, now we're gonna have you live in our world. You know, uh, yeah. Like you said, we're gonna see bicycles and we're gonna see people and we're gonna see a guy with a hat and um, all of that must be, uh, it, it's, it's, just, it's just fascinating to me that they can, they can take that all in in such a short, short period of time you know you know what I like to, to do with my I haven't had a puppy in a long time but when I do work with puppies I like to do the, some of the things that you're talking about I like to let them check stuff right mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll just put a treat next to something and I'll go um here's my baseball hat I'll put it on the floor and then I put a treat next to it. I go check it you know check it right um and and can we start those things really young with these puppies like just checking stuff 
you know, you just can, check it. It's not a big deal. Absolutely to be doing that from the time you bring them home, as long as you're not noticing that the puppy's getting worried and for the exercise that you're talking about, that's perfect because it's not yeah. moving. It's not a threatening object. It's just, all right, there's a yummy treat. And if you put a treat next to a baseball cap, they're probably not even going to notice that baseball cap, which is, yeah. which is exactly what we want. We don't want it to be a big deal. We want them to just go over, hey, there's a treat there. That's fabulous. You know, yeah. maybe if they haven't heard a vacuum cleaner, bring the vacuum cleaner in the room and then play a little bit near the vacuum cleaner. It's not on. It's not doing anything. It's just yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll do that a fair amount with uh, dogs and therapy as well. Just let you check the equipment and at whatever age, it doesn't matter to me if you're a puppy or if you're an older dog, I just let you check it. Like it's just, it just is, it's in the room. It's not, it just is, right? It is. Exactly. <laughs> it is Kathy and I have both been to Best Friends uh, Animal Society, the sanctuary in Kanab, Utah. And I always make a point in, in seeing the puppies and what they do is a very structured thing where they invite a certain number of people to come into this room and they give us the, the rules, uh, the lay of the land, and then the puppies come in. Um, it's a litter typically, and they ask us to do certain things with them depending on where, where they are, you know, in their development and age mm -hmm. and so forth. So, you know, it might just be holding them um, and having them being comfortable with being held or, you know, putting them down and asking them to sit. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the session, and I've done this a few times um, in, at, at uh, Best Friends, they'll do exactly what you were saying, Christy, where uh, one kid will, you know, maybe get a, a skateboard and, you know, skate across the room with the puppies there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I might be moving the vacuum, not that it's on, but, you know, I'm just kind of moving the va vacuum around. Somebody else might be sweeping with a broom. Um, and then they have, th you know, different things there. So, like, I remember the last time they had a big, um, like, like children's pool, you know, a plastic pool for, for outside, mm -hmm. and it was filled with plastic balls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the puppies would just go and dive into that pool of balls, you know, and others were more wary, but they'd watch, you know, their litter mates. Is this okay or not okay? And, uh, you know, that was really interesting. I, I that, that brings me to, that makes me think of something else. It, I mean, I, all of these stages are across the board for all breeds, right? I mean, there must be breeds that have certain personalities or temperaments. Do so you think that makes a certain stage a little bit longer, a little bit more stressful? So like your toy poodle versus your border collie. Um, but all, all the stages of, of mental development should should be about the same, right? They're very similar. They certainly, okay. um, you know, there are stages that some dogs will get to a little bit quicker. Some dogs will go through a little bit slower. Um, but as a guide, those are the, the, the timelines that they tell you, you know, up mm -hmm. to about 14 weeks. And, and it doesn't matter the breed. And certainly um, the... The temperament of the puppy. So what mother nature gave this puppy, you know, that's going to affect how they handle some of those environments. I just have to go back to that best friend's place in Utah, though. I would have never left. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, they would be hard to get me out of that room. Uh, it's very hard. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, so, you know, you have to, you have to handle the puppy. You know, you may have a litter of Labradors who, you know, the world could fall around, but if they have a ball and a treat, they're cool, you know, and then you may have a litter of border collies who, if there's a whole lot of commotion, they're going to be like, okay, this is a little bit more serious. I need to worry about this. Um, so it, it definitely will vary temperament within the breed and temperament, or sorry, within breeds, different breeds and mm -hmm. temperament within its own breed, just mm -hmm. what they got from mother nature. Yeah. yeah. And so even each, each puppy is an individual. So right. even Absolutely. though there's, there's 10 puppies in that litter, every one of them is an individual. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I was going to emphasize is they could be very different even within that litter in terms of their temperament. So we're talking about socialization. Is there anything else you guys want to cover before we go on to the next stage? Yeah, Kathy, there there are a couple things that I looked at um, in terms of my, my research and learned. Uh, so one was that during this early socialization period is also when puppies start to eliminate, you know, pee and poop farther from their, their quarters because they're more mobile. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure that that can be important in terms of, of potty training. 
And then another thing that I read was uh, a little bit later on, they said this was, you know, again, in that five to seven week period, that the weaning process is really important because it teaches puppies to cope with frustration. Mm. So when, you know, mom's saying, "Uh uh-uh, not now. You know, not right, right. I, that that you know the puppies are like what I'm hungry. What do you mean not now? So again, you know that kind of natural stress that happens with the weaning process, and and they learn from it. They learn how to how to cope when they can't always get their way. So you know that's yeah. that's really important. Yeah, and that's really interesting. I hadn't heard that before, but it makes perfect sense. It falls right back into the you know introducing a tiny little bit of stress to these neonates. And then as they get older, they have to deal with a little bit more, a little bit more stress, Mm -hmm. help them become, you know, more stable adults. So that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. All right. So the next stage is the juvenile period, which is from about three months to sexual maturity. Um, And there, it varies from breed to breed. You know, some dogs are going to be sexually mature at eight months, some dogs, 18 months. So it really, it, it can be a short period. It can be a long period. Um, and they're still learning. They're still very much immature dogs. You know, sometimes they they look like they're full grown and they're they're there. They're adults, but they're not. They're still immature. So we have to continue to do that socializing and that the training, the manners, the all of those things that we want from an adult dog. We have to be thinking about during this period because then the next period is adolescence, and just like human adolescence things can get more challenging. So those things that you were allowing to happen during those earlier periods. So the puppy that's nipping at your slippers as you walk through the room, it's a little bit less cute when you have a 40 pound adult dog doing it. Yeah. Right. Right? So you have to, those are things you have to, when you have an adolescent and I have a one-year-old border collie, so I'm, I'm there, I know exactly what it is. You know, the things that you thought were really cute aren't so cute anymore. So you have to manage those behaviors and you have to hopefully try to prevent those behaviors by starting at a very young age, teaching them what's acceptable as opposed to waiting until it goes wrong and then having to correct them. Yeah. And they have to go, but now you have to go back and and correct it. Yeah. Right. Right. And I feel like that's the time during your training where you might have like a little, maybe a little backslide, you know? Absolutely. That that might be the time frame. you know, you might have a little backslide there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just like a, a teenage, like you said, a teenage human, you know, yeah. they're going to, they're going to challenge you a little bit, you know? So, all right. I, you know, I take my dog out for a walk every day and every day I call him and he comes running back to me at that stage. They might go, mm, let me see yeah. what happens. Let me see what happens if I don't, you know, just to sort of like a, like a teenager testing the waters, let's yeah. see if there's any repercussions. So, you know, back to through that, from the day you pick up that puppy, starting to teach them the right things. You know, going back to my first dog, I think a lot of what what went wrong with him was I was I wasn't teaching him the right behaviors, but I was correcting him for doing the wrong thing. Well, how unfair is that? Yeah, you know, I never told you the rules, but now I'm yelling at you for breaking them. Right. You know, so I think if we are showing them the rules the whole time, I'm not saying you never have to correct your teenage dog because you do. Yeah. Um, but but you're at least in within your rights. Like, no, we we talked about it. You know how to come back. Let's work on that. We oh. talked about this. Yeah. So, right. We've had a discussion. We've, we've been we've through this. this. But, you know, no, I, you know, this. Yeah, I don't want you standing on my coffee table. We've talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I've at least explained the rules. And I'm trying, the whole time I'm raising him, I'm trying to think of teaching him the, the proper rules, teaching him the right mm-hmm. rules. So that when he becomes a teenager, hopefully it, it doesn't last very long. And he's like, oh, yeah, all right. I remember now. I'm not supposed to stand on the coffee table now or the dining room table. Yeah, that's a work in progress. (laughs) And like you said, Christy, it's not just constant. No, no, no. You know, people joke about that. Like, you know, my puppy thinks his name is, you know. No, 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 my dad. Yeah, (laughs) no Baxter. (laughs) No Baxter. (laughs) But um, Uh. yeah, you know, like you said, unfair and showing them them the the right things that you expect. And and maybe, Christy, you can give a few more examples. You know, you said like the the puppy nipping at your slip. You know, I think that this happens insidiously and people don't even realize it. And especially if they aren't a big, large breed dog, right? Right. Right. So, um, you know, I think about, this is one thing that I I did. I own it and I still don't mind it a whole lot, Mm -hmm. but I invited my puppies to climb all over me. (laughs) And fortunately, they're only 
12, uh, 12 pounds. So <laughs> right. even now when I lay on the couch, you know, julep will come up, get right on my chest and, you know, stare at my, my face, which makes it a little challenging for television watching, but I know why she's doing it. So I don't yell at her, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, what are some other examples that people may not even re- realize that they're, they're reinforcing and then it's like, uh oh, now this is bad. Right. I, I, the first one that comes to mind and it's, I would say hands down the one that is the most frustrating to most people is jumping up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have this cute little 10 pound, whatever Labrador, whatever breed you have, they come into your house and they, they jump on you and Oh my God, how cute is that? Right. You pick them up, you snuggle them, you pat them, you feed them a treat, you give them their toy because it's really cute when they're that size. And then they start to become a 30 pound dog. And then it suddenly becomes a problem. So one of the things I always, always, always try to teach new puppy owners, and the earlier we start, the better, is that in order to get what you want, you have to work for it. So just something as simple as the sit. They come in, they sit, now I can pet you. You know, and if you start it from, you know, the day you bring them home, you start to think, all right, you know, this is cute now, but it's not going to be so cute later. You start, yeah, all you have to do is sit, and then I will give you whatever you want. Um, and start those good, those good habits at a very young age, because that's probably the biggest one that I see people fr- that are frustrated with, you know, or they, you know, you have somebody in the house and I always blame the boys, but you have someone in the house who's roughhousing and, and wrestling with this, this cute little puppy. So puppies growling and biting and chewing on your hands and pulling on your clothes. And they think it's cute. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, the eight year old little girl is not amused, Yeah, you right. know, or grandma comes to visit and they think it's that it's okay down. to wrestle yeah. with this dog, with this person, you know, and, and grandma's got really fragile skin. So, you know, that's another one that people, I think they, they sort of miss the mark on because they think it's really cute. It's cute that he's biting my hands. It's cute that he's, you know, and yeah. it's not cute because right. it's not going to be cute. Yeah. Whether it's a, you know, a 15 pound adult dog or an 80 pound adult dog, you don't want your dog biting your guests, Mm-mm. even if it's in play. Yeah. Yep. Well, and one I think too about is uh, getting up on the furniture. Mm-hmm. You know, so people will pick up their puppy, put them on the couch with them. You know, this is all acceptable. Call them up onto the couch so that they can love and snuggle them. And then you have, you know, a 140 pound Newfoundland, right. um, you know, in a couple of years that there is no room for you on the, on the sofa anymore. <sighs> right, so. right. Mm-hmm. Or you're drooling too much and our sofa is now one yep. big crusty mess, right? Yep. Now. Yep, <laughs> exactly. And I think that in, in that case, so I, I absolutely... Eh, will admit that I do allow my dogs on the sofa, um, but they have to earn it. So never as a baby are they allowed up. They have to show me that they can handle that responsibility. They can be up on the sofa with me and not be chewing on me, not be digging on the sofa, not be challenging me in another way. So I want to make sure their manners are all in check before I give them that privilege. Nice. So it's, you know, it's not just, all right, you know, you're a baby, you can be on the sofa with me, you know, once in a while, of course, because we all like that little snuggle. Yeah. Um, Cause you do, but you know, it's, it, you have to earn those, those privileges. Do you think it's safe to say too, that maybe we're teaching our dogs that, that every, everything you, you want comes from me. And mm-hmm. so <clears throat> it sh- you know, show me that you can do a sit and I'll, I'll give it to you. Or you want to go outside that comes from me too. So maybe is it safe to say I'm kind of teaching them like uh, it, I'm I'm the leader, but I'm showing you in a positive way, right? right? That everything you want comes from me, and this is what I want you to do to get what you, to, to get it. Does that make sense? It makes <laughs> like perfect I'm, sense. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of establishing my role as a leader, but in a positive way. Absolutely, and you know, one of the the things that I always tell people is, um, and it came from a behaviorist that I worked with before, was nothing in life is free. Right. So, you know, nothing in life is free. So they learn really quickly. You know, when we talk about positive reinforcement, it's whatever is valuable to the dog. And we almost always go to food. That's what our, where our head goes. And we almost, all, you know, then the second thing is maybe a toy. But to your point, going outside, that's a huge reward. So if you want to go outside, you can absolutely go outside. You just sit and now I'll open the door and you can go out. And I do that, that one particular exercise for a couple of reasons. I don't want to get pushed out the door. Me I don't want to get shoved. I don't, you know, so you sit and here you go. You can go outside, you know, yeah. your dinner. That's a huge reward. So you have to sit and work for that dinner. 
you know, yeah. if you want yeah. me to throw this toy for you, yeah, I'll throw this toy yeah, for you, it. but you sit. We, and uh, yeah. We taught Mac, you know, when we first got him and we've had him for a year now and he's almost three that here's the place that you sit when you, when it's time for dinner and you have to be quiet. You can't have like countertop chaos. You can't mm -hmm. be like barking. Thing. And so you have to sit on the mat. You have to sit quietly while I'm making your dinner and then I'll feed you on the mat. Well, don't you know, you know a couple months in, he started to go get the <laughs> mat and bring it <laughs> to where I feed him. And he's like, okay, this is what we do. I, I've got the mat. I'm sitting on it. <laughs> and now it's time to eat. And I couldn't help but laugh. I was like, that's so brilliant. He's brilliant. Yes. He's like, okay, this is what we do. You sit on the mat and then you get fed. I'll just bring the mat to where you get fed and then I'll get fed. Um, I don't know if that's so brilliant. I, I thought that was a just, I think it's brilliant. Well, I think it's pretty it's brilliant. Or too. Very yeah. conniving and manipulative. He is so good. your number, Kathy. He's, he's an evil genius, Chris. He really <laughs> is. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we've, we've sort of, you know, put the kibosh on that. You know, I had to put the mat somewhere where he could, it only comes out when it's time for meals. But, uh, but I thought it was brilliant. You know, he's like, well, you know, I can figure this out. I would like to eat now. So I'll show her, you know, right. but uh, it's interesting, just it, interesting that my dog is thinking, uh, thinking that way and thinking ahead of me a little bit, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. interesting, yeah. smart, smart guy. <laughs> oh, and handsome too. He's smart and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> So, Christy, are there any other um, stages of development that we want to touch on, or can we transition to kind of the correlate uh, physically? Um, you know, Kathy and I being physical rehabilitationists, you know, I think we're always uh, concerned with the, the proper development from a, you know, physical uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the, you know, mental, emotional, you know, can't be separated out from the physical. We, we always touch on this in every show that, that we've done so far and, and are strong advocates for having, you know, soundness, both physically and, uh, you know, psycho-emotionally. Well, let's get into the physical aspect unless the, I, I think we covered all the, did we cover all the stages, right, Christine? We did. We did. Yeah. Okay. So we're really, yeah, I'm really dying to get into the physical. I have so much, so many, so many questions, <laughs> so many, uh -oh. but why don't you talk to, tell us, I know, why don't you tell us what the physical development is for the puppy? Okay. So um, there's, there's really sort of three stages. So up to six months, they're, they're just rubbery little babies that, you know, you, you have to be so careful about what you allow them to do. Mm -hmm. They, um, they're, they're growing exponentially. We have to be careful about letting them run too much, letting them jump off of things. Um, they have growth plates, which are the weakest part of their skeleton system. Once those growth plates are closed, when they're adults, their normal bone. But up until then, those growth plates are the weakest part. So they're more susceptible to injury. So we have to be sure to keep those thing, those growth plates safe. So no, like I said, jumping off of big things, no, you know, no doing agility until they're closed, being really careful about what we're doing with these babies. Um, and the growth plates, depending on the breed, can close anywhere from sort of, you know, eight months to 18 months. There's a big you know, if you have a great Dane, it's going to be much older as opposed to a toy poodle. Mm -hmm. um, so then um, from there, you have about six months up until maturity. So then you can start to introduce a little bit of exercise a little bit more because they're starting to mature and th their brains definitely need a little bit more, you know, exercise. But you still have to be very cautious of those growth plates. If, if there's an injury to the growth plates you can cause malformation of the bone. You can cause that bone to the, the growth plate to close too early. So you can end up with a shorter limb. So you have to be really careful of those. And Christy, I think, you know, you and I both do uh, agility at the same facility. Um, but it it's not to say that I think during this period, you can start introducing things mm -hmm. like agility, but it's modified. Absolutely. So again, you go to a reputable place that knows these things in terms of both the mental and physical development. And, you know, you're exposing them to these things, you're diminishing any sort of, you know, fear, you're making them bomb proof, but you're also starting to challenge them physically, but in a safe way that's not going to co compromise their physical growth and, and damage those, those growth plates. 
Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I was, when I was looking through preparing for today was um, when you have puppies up to six months, you can absolutely be introducing them because you don't want to wait. God, if you waited till you were, they were 18 months old to introduce them to any agility equipment, you'd have a whole different problem, but you, you can have them around. But for puppies up to six months, that, that you're going to do a little jump should be no higher than their wrist. So basically the bars on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, up to from six months up until their growth plates are closed, you can start to gradually move it up, but no higher than their elbow. So very carefully, you know, moving it up, but being very careful about not going too high because we don't want them jumping high. Mm. Yep. I like to introduce them to different. <clears throat> um, it went to be, even at that stage, just even different textures. You know, they get so much information from their feet, and they're so young. Uh, um, even just like different textures of things when you're, you go to the agility ring, maybe just walk across, you know, that, the, the, the bridge, I don't know what they call that, the dog walk, <laughs> you know, yeah. even the dog walk, just walk, you know, across that, get the feeling and the sensation for what that feels like, um, and, uh, maybe go up or down, uh, but not maybe making sure they come down off that contact and not jump straight out, you know, but just even getting the feel for what that feels like or what things feel like with their feet, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and most agility um, facilities, at least the ones that I've been to, they have a very much a modified set of equipment. So for puppies, they are going to have a board that's very similar to what the dog walk is, but it's on the ground. Yeah, so you get yeah, them right. used to just walking across that board because that's really important. But if they slip off, they're going, you know, an inch off the ground because it's on the ground. Yep. Um, yep. You know, and you start, you have a, a little ramp, but you put it up at, you know, maybe a 10 degree angle. So it, again, if they, if they are unsure of it because they're nervous or scared, or if they slide off because they're too excited, there's not a big drop. So mm -hmm. most of the time you can work with, and if you're, you're, if you're at a, a, a facility that you trust, they're going to help you with that. But it's always your responsibility, isn't it? It's always up to the pet owner to do what's best for their puppy. Right. So you mentioned three physical periods. I think we got through two. What's oh, okay. The final so then the one? last one is just six months to growth plate closure. Oh, sorry. No, the last one is once those growth plates are closed. So, you know, you, you're not going to take your, your, I'm going to use Labrador again, your 14 month Labrador who is fully skeletally mature and start doing 10 mile bike rides. You're going to start to do any sort of endurance or, um, aerobic exercise very gradually. And one of the recommendations that I've read was you can start with once, once you know, those growth plates are closed. And the only real way to know that is x-rays. Mm -hmm. um, not, not everyone's going to do that. And because it's not cheap and I understand that. So I would always err on the side of caution. So if I had a big dog and I wasn't sure I wasn't going to x-ray, I would probably wait until they're 18 months to start doing anything like jogging or, or running with them. Um, but once you're going to start doing that, you start doing it gradually. So maybe a 20 minute jog three times a week and then start to build it up from there. Crap. That's intense. I can't do 20 minutes three times a week. I didn't say I was doing it. I'm saying I read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's conditioning. We're conditioning. <laughs> I know my dog could do it. I could not. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> So that's the adult. So then, so yeah. let's summarize those again. So there's three physical periods. The yeah. first one is called what? It's just, it's not, I don't have a name for it. It's just up to six months. So just to six months. Babies. Yeah. Or the and rubbery. The, things, the right, second the rubbery. one is um, six months to grow, growth plate closure. And I, and that would kind of equate with their adolescence in terms of their yeah. emotional development. Yep. And yep. then once their growth plates close, they're just an adult, they're an adult. And yep. again, at this point, if you've done all the right things in terms of your training and, uh, you know, socialization and, and so forth, they should be pretty sound, both mentally and physically. Right, right. So can we talk about the most fun part of the puppy? And that is, how do I get, how do I pick my puppy? Can we talk about picking a puppy? Yeah. Um, can we talk about picking a puppy right now? Can we, can we go? We can, <laughs> can we go actually go pick a puppy right now? Because, you know, we talked about the, the, the mental and emotional part of the, of the dog's life or the puppy's life. And we talked about the physical aspects of the puppy's life, but now we're going to talk about us. How do we get that right puppy in the litter? How do we know um, that those puppies are uh, where they should be emotionally and mentally? Right. Mm -hmm. And how do we know physically, like, is it, is it, 
possible for us to know what their uh, the stability of the dog is as far as their frame and what they're going to look like as adults. Um, you know, are they are they healthy in their structure? And is there a way for us to know this when we go pick that puppy? Because usually you go and you look at the puppies and you go, the one that comes over to you that you're like, that's my one. Right? Right. But there should be a process to it, right? We should look at all the puppies and, and what should we know? Right. So I find picking a puppy very difficult because you want them all. Right. Um, and I think you have to use your, your brain as opposed to your heart when you start thinking about getting a puppy. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I do believe that when you go look at a litter of puppies, all right, I'll have that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'll take that one. Or <laughs> that, that one. one. And or that, that one. one. <laughs> yeah, or that's okay. Um, so I think you have to do some homework ahead of time. You know, it's not a matter of, okay, this weekend we're going to go get a puppy. You have mm-hmm. to decide, you know, really spend a lot of time researching breeds, decide what the right breed for your family is. Um, because, you know, not everyone should have a Rottweiler. Yeah. Not everyone should have a German Shepherd. Not everyone should have a Border Collie. You have to figure out your lifestyle, you know, is my lifestyle that, that I'm going to go out for a three mile hike every single day. And if that's not the case, you know, that's okay. But maybe you don't go for whatever breed you were thinking. And, and also look at what the breeds are bred for. One of the most eye opening to me is a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Ridgeback. So they're actually bred to bring down lions. Like that's what they do. That's a hardy dog. So (laughs) that's a hardy dog. (laughs) Right. So that's a tough dog, you know, so you have to look at what they're bred to do. And we've, we've domesticated these dogs and we've, we've got these dogs now more for the show ring than we do for what they actually work to do. But Mm -hmm. I, that's still in their, that's still in their genes to do what their job was, you know, so you have to decide what the breed is. Once you decide what the breed is, then you have to find a breeder and your, your most important criteria shouldn't be who's the closest. Right. Uh, You know, a lot of people, you know, they're all right, well, this breeder is, you know, 15 miles away, that's convenient. And it may be, but it may not be the right breeder. So the things that I would start to do is talk to the breeder, find out if they do any clearances for their, for their breeding dogs. So by clearances, I mean, you know, every, all these breeds are going to have different things that can be a problem in their breed. So most Mm -hmm. dogs, hips and elbows need to be sent off to the Orthopedic Foundation of America to make sure that they're clear. They don't have hip dysplasia. They don't have elbow dysplasia. You want to make sure they're doing their clearances. There's other breeds that you, they will do clearances for eyes, clearances for heart. And they're getting so far into it. Now Labradors do do clearances for exercise intolerance. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that's, that's a thing. They have collapse, uh, yeah. exercise-induced collapse. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I, I don't know that many breeders that are doing that yet. Um, yeah. But, you know, these are things that you need to find out what they should be doing for the breed that you've chosen. And if right. they're not, if they say, you know, my dog's hips are fine, then I would probably move on. Uh-huh. You know, you want to make sure th- that those are the things that are going to give you the best chance of having a sound puppy. doesn't uh-huh. mean it's a guarantee. Yeah. There's no guarantee, right. um, but at least if they're doing everything that they can, uh-huh. then you can feel comfortable with them. So that's sort of where I would start if time permits, because they don't always breed all the time. If they always have litters ready, I might also yeah. be looking elsewhere. Yeah. And maybe um, get to look at the parents if you get well, that's if you're what there. I was yeah. Say. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I would uh, ask if I can go and meet the parents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And I think that any, um, I, you know, I don't see it as much in the smaller breeds, although we should be doing it. But I think any good breeder of large dogs is going to have their dogs um, OFA, you know, uh, certified, yep. have their elbows screened um, and, and such. And you should be able to have, uh, they should be able to share that information with you. Absolutely. Um, and we probably should be doing it more in smaller dogs. I don't see as much in smaller dogs in the clinic for getting, you know, OFAs and so forth. But um but again, same thing, you know, can I meet the parents? Um, hey, do you have the number of anybody else who has one of your puppies? I'd like to talk to them too. Is there somebody that I can uh, reach out to that has one of your dogs to see uh, where they are, you know, physically? And you're right, there's always the chance, right? There's always the chance. They've never had hip dysplasia in the line. And then, you know, right. You know, one, right. they get one puppy that has hip dysplasia. So right. 
uh, I think those are really good places to start. Mm-hmm. But what if what if you're not going through a breeder? What if you're going to through a rescue organization or a shelter? You don't have that ability to know about, you know, their Maybe life not. before, um, you know, to meet the parents and so forth. So so then, you know, what are what are some things that we should look for? You know, like, is it is it? you know, a dog that, that is, you know, really affable or, you know, is, is it bad if they're a bit shy, you know, can that be overcome? You know, what are some of those things? So as, yeah. So as far as the, the behavior, the, the mental stability of a puppy, I, I, I find it very difficult to go look at a litter of puppies once and make any judgments Mm. Um, because you may have come in right after um, the puppies have been playing. And now one puppy's exhausted over in the corner, sound asleep. <laughs> but that was the, so you may Fair think point. that's the puppy for me. This is the quiet one. But that was yeah. the one that had everyone all riled up. All you know. So I, I, I for any litter of puppies, I always recommend going, you know, a couple times before you actually make your decision. Sure. Sometimes in shelters you don't get that opportunity, and you have to rely heavily on what the people in the shelter or the rescuer are telling you. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to say, all right, that one over in the corner, don't, don't believe it. Don't trust him. He's crazy. You know, so you have to, if you can do several visits, I think the the physical aspect of it is probably a little bit more challenging um, because you just don't know. And with a puppy, you know, you, if you x-ray a 12 week old puppy to see if their hips are okay, they're not going to look okay at 12 weeks. (laughs) You know, <laughs> nothing's attached. Nothing. You know. Nothing's attached. It doesn't look like there. Yeah, it looks like you put together a Lego set right, and not exactly, and miss the joints exactly. or something. Right. Um, yeah, I think that the, the you know you can do preliminaries on dogs at six months, but I don't think they certify the dogs until they're about two. If you're going or through two, a breeder, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. So you know, so behavior wise, I would try to observe on more than one occasion and get as much information information as you can from the people that are working with the puppy the most. Uh Uh I maybe even rely again on what you think the breed or what the dominant breed is in that, that puppy, you know, does it, does it look like a lab puppy? You know, does it look like a a basset hound puppy? So. Right. I agree. A a couple personal anecdotes. Um, We had gotten a a cavalier. She unfortunately passed at a, at Mm -hmm. a young age of seven. And then we waited a couple years because we were going to try to, to rescue and and uh, just nothing tripped our trigger and every time we saw cavaliers we're like oh so we decided that that we wanted another cavalier um, and there were none in this area you know to your point Christy about like close by and um, we ended up getting uh, the two that we got from Texas and this was a woman who uh, th- these were pets. Um, you know, she did all the appropriate things in terms of, of uh, screening for health issues, and she only had one litter a year, you know, to your point about like mm-hmm. having litters, you know, available all the time. But she was very clear from the get go that these puppies are what she said bred for temperament and personality. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, both of you have seen, seen uh, our dogs, and you know, they're not. They're cute, but they're not they're adorable. Breed, breed standard, you know, in terms of their coat, um, their their height to length, you know, ratio, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but she made a point. She she had uh, children in her own household. Her elderly parents lived across the street, um, and so these puppies, you know, to your point, Christy, were exposed to different things and handled and so forth, you know, all their, their lives up until we got them at 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, you know, I mean, Cavaliers are friendly by nature anyway, but you know, they, they really were um, uh, quite sound in terms of, of their temperaments and so forth. Now, the mistake I made is we intended to get the little female on the website and then uh, my partner saw the male and we decided to get two. <laughs> and for anybody out there that doesn't know, uh, you should never get litter mates for the reasons that we said earlier and that they definitely packed together. Yeah. So they didn't <laughs> come to us until they were about 10 weeks. 
we could not train them. They did not listen to us at all. They were, you know, you said, Christy, <laughs> about beating each other up. We called it the grizzly. So almost 24-7, they were up on their hind legs like grizzly oh bears that fight. Yeah. And it was this, you know, and it was awful. So uh, at the suggestion of, of our agility instructor, she said, you need to separate these guys. And so I had a friend that, that took one of the puppies, and, you, and it was the shire one that should go, the, the less dominant. So Baxter went and lived with my friend Jan, and then uh, we swapped them. But they didn't, um, without seeing each other, they didn't see each other for almost 12 weeks. Wow. And when they came back together, they did not recognize each other. They were, they were Interesting. Sweet, but, they were, Interesting. Um, but now all is well. And if we hadn't done that, I think it would have been a, a real mess. But, um, you know, we all we all live and learn. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the point that uh, Christy made, because I think this is a big takeaway about picking the breed of dog. Or even if you're going to get a rescue, maybe kind of getting a sense for what the dominant breed is in that rescue dog that fits your lifestyle mm -hmm. and your your home. You know, when I, the very first year, you know, my husband and I, the very first year we got married, I said, you know, I want a dog. And I wanted, I am just in love with Dobermans. I mm -hmm. just, it's, I just feel melty and gooey when I see them, you know, I, I just really like them. And my husband said, that's ridiculous, Kathy. You can't go for more than that. He said, you can't go for more than a 20 minute walk. Right. And he said to me, I want to, I want a pug. And I thought, ah, oh, that is not going to be enough dog for me, but it was, it was the perfect amount of dog for me. Right. Um, you know, we take when it's not too cold or not too hot, you know, we're looking at a 40 minute, you know, 40 minute hike in the woods. That's good for me. That's all I can do. Yeah. Um, he likes to, you know, we wanted a dog that snuggles on the couch. He loves to sit on your lap. Those are the things that we wanted. And we still can do fun things like we can do nose work with him. Mm -hmm. He loves that. So we can mm -hmm. still do some of the fun things that we do and not have him take a three hour walk or, you know, right. <laughs> um, because it didn't fit my lifestyle. And I think that would have been disastrous. You know, if I had had a dog that of that size, and that intensity, um, it would have gone really wrong. And my husband was right. We needed a smaller dog that was more, uh, maybe not fit our activity level, fit our work schedules, right? right. We have to make sure right. the dog fits our work schedules and so forth. And the pug was the perfect dog. So we've had pugs ever since. Yeah. Bugs, my little dog, he, um, I got him because he was um, sold to a family and at 12 weeks old proved to be too aggressive for them. And he's mm -hmm. a Cavalier Bichon mix, for goodness sake. You know, you don't yeah. really expect aggression out of those. You don't dogs. really, yeah, yeah. You know, you don't. But so they had to give him up because they couldn't handle him. And I found with him, he thinks he's a German Shepherd, so it's perfect for me. Um, but he he needed to work. He needed exercise. We we have walked him ten miles in one day, and he's been ready to go. All right, we're, what are we doing next? Mm -hmm. What's next? You know, and he's he's a sixteen pound dog. So you're absolutely right that. You have to figure out the size and the temperament dog that that's perfect for your family, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be. It's, it's got to be or, or to the best of your ability and match. Right. You know, to, right. to your lifestyle. Yeah, right. So, right. a couple of things. I know that, uh, we're running long here because this is so fascinating. But I was just wondering. Um, I guess two things. One, Christy, can you can you expound on what is happening right now in terms of this pandemic and how it's affecting puppies and dogs in general? Um, so I can. And I think what happened was at the beginning of COVID, we all thought it was going to be a month, two months. And everyone thought, all right, well, I'm home right now. This is the perfect time to go get a dog or a puppy. And I think the problem then became they had nowhere to go with that dog or puppy. And they had no help from trainers because these facilities were closed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, they've gone out, they've gotten this little puppy, and now they, they don't know where to socialize. And a lot of the people that I've come in contact with through work or, or through um, just out with my dog, out walking, they just, they don't, they didn't, they weren't aware of what they needed, what they were getting themselves into. Mm -hmm. And I think that certainly for myself, when I started with dogs, I, I, my dog trainers were everything to me. They were helping me with all these things that I didn't know that I didn't know. Right. So when you get a new puppy, you're now sort of stuck with, I don't know what to do. And I don't know where to go for help. 
So they're not going to classes to get socialized. The owners aren't going to work. So they're home with them all day long. They're not teaching them to be on their own. Um, they're, they're, the, the socialization, I think, is probably the biggest one. They're, they're just not able to get the help. And I think that things like that are happening a lot. I have a friend who, who runs an animal rescue out of um, Newburyport. And they're very, very, very careful about who they'll home a, a dog with all the time, but now even more so. Don't tell me that you're home right now all the time. I don't want to know that. I want to know what your life's going to be like when you go back to work. Um, because I think those things are really important. I, I'm guessing that we're going to have a lot of uh, separation anxiety. I know that in the, in our dogs and puppies, mm -hmm. I... I um, I've talked to some professionals that uh, even pet communicators that have said that some of these these pets are like, please go back to work because like the owners <laughs> in their face all the time and they yeah. need some downtime. They need some, they you know, ten, yeah, they're going for 10 walks a day. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they need some, some, like you said, Christy, independence and so forth. But, you know, I think that uh, if, they're, if their uh, world is so small, you know, that can also lead to boredom and destructive behaviors, um, you know, because they aren't getting the mental challenge, they aren't getting the socialization, they aren't getting, you know, necessarily physically, um, you know, exercise as much as, as they should. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it remains to be seen, but, um, you know, I, I and I know, Christy, you and I have talked about, too, when you don't have access, when an owner doesn't have access to maybe some of these resources during this time, you just have to be creative, you know. Right. I try to get my dogs out, if I can, for one new adventure every day. I'm wow. a young puppy. And in, the adventure may not be that much of an adventure. It may be, I'm going to walk to the mailbox at the mail at the post office. You know, it's not a big adventure. I might sit outside a Target and let people say hello. But one new adventure a day. And they should, you should shoot for meeting five new people a day, which is mm. not easy to do right now with COVID. Mm. Yeah. You know, even being yeah. out walking when he was young, thankfully, I got him before the real lockdown happened. But, you, you know, I will make an, a point if I see a puppy out of, you know, having my mask on, but getting down to this puppy and like, this puppy needs to be meeting people. Yeah. Can I say hi? Yeah. Can I please say hi to your puppy? And most owners are like, yes, please. Because, you know, no one wants to come that close. You know, I would also make a point of with my own puppy, putting him on a slightly longer leash so that if someone wanted to say hello, I could, they could feel safe that I could lo loosen up that leash a little bit and keep some distance, but they could still say hello. Mm -hmm. You know, and these are things that I don't think that people are are taking into account when they bring home this new dog, how much work is going to go into it. You know, the, the training, the, the behaviors that they should be teaching them, the, the manners they should be teaching them, the fact that they should put them in a crate and go outside for 20 minutes so that they can cope with being in the house alone. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Right. We do, we do that with Mac. You know, he's already, he was crate trained when we got him and he sleeps in his crate. He loves his crate. Sometimes when he wants his private time, he'll just go through his crate. Um, but I try to make a point of going out a few minutes every day, you know, with him, leave, put him in his crate and then go out for a 10 yeah. minute walk, you know, right. just right. to remind him. It's, exactly. Remind Even him when it's you don't safe. have to go out, you're making a point of it because yeah. you have to keep those skills up. Or there's yeah. no place to go, right? There's nowhere for us to go, but you right. have to make an effort to, to get out of the house so that they realize that it's not always, you're not always going to be there. And, you know, when, mm -hmm. and when you're, when you're dealing with dogs who are learning to be alone, it doesn't need to be for three, four hours. If they're yeah. alone and quiet in their crate for 15, 20 minutes, you're okay. Success. Yeah. 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 Success. <laughs> yeah. One more thing I just wanted to touch on real quick is I've heard this thing about there are fear periods mm -hmm. when when puppies are, are growing up. When are, first of all, is that a real thing? Secondly, if it is, when is it? And thirdly, what can we do to to prevent this fear? Okay, so yeah, it is a real thing. Um, definitely, puppies go through. I think they go through them throughout their adolescence, right, right up and through. But the, the technical time for a fear period is between eight to 10, 12-ish weeks. So it sort of doubles over with that socialization period, which can uh -huh. make it a little bit tricky. Uh -huh. um, and it, what, what happens is that they're just more, their fearfulness is more likely during that period. So um, one of the examples that I had read was if you had a five-week-old puppy that someone was walking towards the puppy and they had a very, I don't recommend doing this, but I'm just, it's an example, <laughs> had a very mild electric shock mm -hmm. as that person was approaching. At five weeks old, 
if you retested that puppy, like they may show fear when it happens, like, oh, what just happened? But at five weeks old, if you retested them, if that same person walked up, they're going to be fine. If you did that same test to an eight or nine week old puppy, that tiny little electric shock as a person approached, that's going to stick with them. Mm. And they're likely still going to be nervous of that person approaching. So, you know, it, it was just really interesting to me that that, that point, that time in their life is so important to make everything so positive. And that doesn't mean that accidents aren't going to happen. So you walk near a puppy and you accidentally stepped on his paw. Yes. You know, that's terrifying. So what you need to do is work really hard at trying to keep everything positive. So that's a time where if you have an older dog in the house, you don't know how that dog or your friend comes to visit with their dog. You don't know how that dog is with puppies. I'm not going to let them visit. Yeah. I want to know that that dog that's visiting with my puppy is bomb proof before I let him near my puppy. Because if he had a little, even if it's just a little growl, it might have a bigger impact on that nine week old puppy than it would on a 14 week old puppy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it means you need to walk around on, on pigs and eagles, right? right? Because I think that you, you know, they have to learn to cope with some things. And if something happens, I think the worst thing you can do is say, oh, well, you know, we'll never do that again because he's afraid of that. Mm -hmm. So you have to try to help them through, you know, maybe if I'm, I don't know if my blinds fell when my dog was eating his dinner and now he doesn't want to go near his bowl. I'm going to get him back to his bowl, hopefully. And then I might touch the blinds while he's eating. I might, you know, to try to, to build that back up. But I do think that in those fear impact phases, I think that they're much more susceptible to, to, to negative things happening, even if we don't realize that they happened. Right. And there are some breeders who won't send a puppy home in that period. Mm. So if you can't pick up your puppy by eight weeks, they're not sending that puppy home the next week ah. because they're too concerned about how that puppy might perceive their the car ride. Right. The car ride, the everything. Yeah. So a lot of them will, will then make you wait until closer to, to 10, 11, 12 weeks. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I love this, this conversation. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> and now I want a puppy. <laughs> well, I always want a puppy, but... <laughs> And now oh, I don't, I'm lazy. I don't want a puppy. Because... Oh, but Chris, I want the puppy breath and the puppy feet. But, yes. you know, to, no. to, you know, if there's one thing I learned from this conversation today, it's that, you know, my, my lifestyle would not accommodate that right now. And so <laughs> as cute as puppies are, um, you have to, like you said, you have to use your brain and maybe not, not so much your heart in that situation. So it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. It's hard because who doesn't want a puppy? Everybody loves a puppy. Right. Right. So what do you, what would you say, let's, let's, what do we want to leave the audience with? Just what's the, what's the takeaway? What's the one thing you want people to know about puppies? I think for me, the takeaway is sort of how I started in that when you're looking at getting a puppy, yes, it's a ton of work. And if, if, and it's okay, if you're not up for that work, if you recognize, you know, there's a lot of people that I don't, I don't, a puppy's not for me right now, you know, and that's absolutely fine. You get an adult dog, you get a, a you know, a, a teenager, but when you get a puppy, it's a lot of work, but don't forget that it's so much fun because mm -hmm. if you're not having fun, then there's no point. It, it's so much, <laughs> there's not right. Like if it's not fun, if you're getting stressed, you're losing sleep. If you're then, then there's a problem and, and reach out for help. Find someone who can help you. Um, because it's, it's a lot of work and there's days when you're frustrated, but for the, for the most part of it, they, it should be fun. They're little sponges. They want to be with you. They want to learn. They want to play. It should be fun. Oh, yeah. That's a great, a great conclusion. I love it should that. Be fun. It Puppy should be fun. equals fun. It yep. should be fun. <laughs> it's work, but it's fun. It's worth it. It's worth it. Yep. Christy, thank you so much for giving no, us all of you. your time and vast knowledge today. I know it's going to help. It helped me already, but it's going to help a lot of our listeners. Yeah. Thank you, Christy. This was wonderful. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to EnableYourPet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.